Hello again, everyone. My name is Adam Kassar from Globis. Welcome again to another episode of Inside Japan. Uh, today, we're in this wonderful office uh, in Maranochi overlooking the Emperor's Palace. I don't know if you can see the Emperor's Palace there in the background. Um, I'm here today with Daisuke Khan, who is third generation manager of uh, Cherio Japan, which is a, be a Japanese beverage company. Hi, Daisuke. Thanks very much. Hi. Thanks for your time. Thank you for coming. Um, so, can we start off, Daisuke? Can you just tell us a bit about your background? Uh, you know, who are you? You know, mm -hmm. what do you do, and so on. Okay. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, I was born and raised in Japan, and you know, after graduating from college, I straight uh, I went straight to a business school in California, uh, which was a Stanford. Uh, studying there like for two years, and came back actually after wandering around the world for a year to join my family business. So Wandering around the world? Yes. <laughs> Can you say, I mean, which countries did you go to? Uh, so I was in New York. I was based on based in New York for nine months after graduation, uh, kind of, you know, looking for entrepreneurial opportunity or something. Mm. But my visa was actually expiring. So, um, okay. <laughs> you know, what I decided to do was uh, going to Brazil and Argentina, you know, for uh, like two weeks to like a month. Fantastic. Enjoying... Uh, Carnival in Rio and wow. maybe making you know, some steaks in Argentina. So before <laughs> I come back to Japan, <laughs> fantastic. And can you tell our few, uh -huh. uh, yeah, our viewers a bit about your job and uh -huh. uh, a bit about the company Cheerio Japan? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, my first projects were kind of divesting uh, some of like uh, our operations, which right. was not necessarily doing good. Uh, we had a publishing operation. Uh, which like you know comprised of uh, thirty people, right. and it was actually not doing great at all. And uh, business is focused on drinks, so mm. it was completely like, you know, we are kind of alien to that industry. Right. Uh, we had it like as a part of family business, so I was kind of told to go in, you know, to turn around. But you know, we just kind of decided that. Fortunately, we found the buyer, so like we kind of you know try to divest it. Mm -hmm. So you know, my the deal was done by six, within six months, mm -hmm. and it's gone now. Okay. And then like you know, I was like, maybe possibly like thinking about com going back to California, but my father told me that like I had to turn around the other operation, which is operation in Chubu, mm -hmm. you know, around Nagoya area. So I started to go in, go going to uh, a tube operation every week, you know, for three to four days, uh, starting, you know, I think four years ago. Mm. So since then, like I got into a uh, drink business. Uh, I've done a lot of things, you know, starting from, you know, cutting costs by negotiating, you know, with suppliers. Mm to maximize the profitability and also uh, we I figured out that you know human training is very important mm. so you know I started uh, initiated the recruiting uh, uh, efforts mm. for the first time in eight years uh, so we didn't hire anybody right like, you know, four years ago but now we have 30 people comes in every year almost and also uh, I'm I'm assuming that we are welcoming a uh, foreigner from mm. Cameroon uh, next April. From Cameroon? Yes, wow. we are very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask Daisuke, yeah. I mean, obviously you, you you have an MBA from Stanford mm. in yes. the US, mm. I mean, one of the top business schools mm. in the world, and then you actually, you know, go into your family business, mm -hmm. you, uh, so you have a chance to actually apply mm -hmm. all the management theory mm -hmm. that you learn. Did you find there was some kind of a gap between you know the realities of mm -hmm. actually trying to make things happen, mm -hmm. and what you what you kind of studied at Stanford. Or? Um, yes, I when I first came back to my family business, you know, actually I I didn't work before business school, so you know I went to college and I went straight into business school, so you know I was just not sure like you know what professional life is going to be mm. like, so. Coming back to business school, like, you know, first thing I started doing was basically look up for, uh, look out the financial statement, which ah. was a complete mistake, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was not sure about anything. So I started to, like, you know, look out for, you know, kind of maybe trying to, like, you know, find the KPI or whatever, you know, just following the textbook. 
So, you know, doing that didn't necessarily make sense, you know, for to turn around the business. So I started to also like, you know, interview every single person, you know, face to face and just asking question, you know, where, you know, I find questions. Right. So, you know, that dialogue, you know, helped me understand the business and the people mm. very well. And, you know, just starting from there, I could build on to like, you know, people's argument mm. and try to like kind of you know, create, co-create actually the solution to potential issues. And, you know, I was complete alien or stranger, you know, in any kind of business. Yeah. So, you know, I could be very straightforward, very simple minded. And, you know, anytime like I found ambiguity in answers or something too difficult to understand, you know, I find issues there. So that's kind of I, how I like do it. Even now, like I just ask questions. Fantastic. So mm. not knowing the business mm. so well was actually an advantage because as an outsider, you were mm. asking all these very kind of direct, plain questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, in my case, because, you know, a lot of people are just following how they used to do things. So they are not necessarily building onto their future. So they are not necessarily taking risk. So, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, from... From the as as a as outsider, it was very difficult to figure mm. out, you know, why you know things are like this, right. you know, always. So, in that case, sometimes like you know, uh, my fresh view, kind of help figure out figuring out like you know the issues because everyone's just so used to where you know mm. where they are, mm. and you know that's they just take it took it so. Granted, I guess. Right, right. Fantastic. So, mm. Before moving on, can I, mm. on this point, can I just ask one more question right. about, I mean, any leader who's trying to bring change into mm -hmm. a company, right, mm -hmm. then one challenge is trust, right? Mm -hmm. Because people feel very insecure, right. you know, am mm -hmm. I going to lose my job? What's yeah, going to happen? Yeah. How did you go about kind of building in with the trust part? With, mm. yeah. I think, I'm not sure, like, you know, if people are kind of, put trust on me. I mean, first thing I was told when I went to a tube operation mm. was be a man or be a, like, you know, be a person like who I can trust. I, see. I was told by my employee, you know, just, you know, if you're an executive director, like, you know, just be the executive director, like, you know, who bring me relief or whatever. So I was like, wow, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm the like, you know, then like I, I was late 20s and, you know, just came into like, you know, my family business. Yeah. And people assumed that, oh, you know, this guy's coming because, you know, I was the son of the president or something. So, you know, I always kind of try to be myself mm. and try to be authentic. I never like, you know, uh, never behave like you have to follow my order because I'm superior than you mm. in or in organization. Mm -hmm. You know, we really have to like you know kind of build, uh, like a map or like you know kind of mutual understanding, where people kind of feel okay, this is the di right direction. This mm. is the right thing to do mm -hmm. because we our goal is this. You know, if we cannot empathize to each other, it's so difficult to like you know sustain and you know keep the organization running. So, you know, it's like, you know, in short, I guess, like, you know, be myself and just be open to criticism. Mm. It's very hard, but, you know, try, you have to do, do it like sometimes. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah. That's kind of how I do it. I think I'd like to use mm -hmm. that quote in, in some of my, because I'm teaching organization mm -hmm. behavior and leadership at Globe. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to use that quote okay. and just give <laughs> some of the classes. Thank uh, you very much. Can I add one to one thing? Yeah, so please. Like, and also, uh, profit is very important. Profit? Yes. Um, you know, you have to make, uh, you know, the company profitable or you have to bring benefit or profit. So if I'm only saying right things, people are not listening. Mm -hmm. By me coming, you know, you kind of have to raise the prof profitability or like bring some profit to company so that, you know, company is paying more bonuses or like paying more salary. And that will, you know, make you feel good because you are bringing back more money to your family. So I think, yes. you know, you have to combine those like pra pra practical like uh, profit with, you know, something right. 
conceptually. Fantastic. So, so you know, I, I have a word to say. That. Yeah, okay. so showing results, mm -hmm. and then that, that kind of builds a positive, mm -hmm. it's a positive cycle, yes. right? Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Daisuke, you, mm -hmm. you, earlier on, you, I mean, Cheerio was, Cheerio mm -hmm. was founded by your grandfather around yes. the 1960s, right? Yes. Or can you just, mm -hmm. just tell us a bit, you were telling us a bit about his background before. Can yes, you my grandfather us? came from Inner Mongolia, Man, then called Manchuria, when he was 14. And, you know, after, right after World War II, it was kind of, you know, random period. I'm not sure how he, you know, kind of grew his business. But, uh, you know, interestingly, like, he got the right to distribute sugars in Japan. So, you know, sugar business was growing, but, uh, you know, following economic expansion mm. right after World War II mm. in Japan. And he randomly bought, he was asked to buy, you know, a couple of dying, like, franchisee bottlers of 7-Up Canada Dry PepsiCo because, you know, our drinks use sugars. <laughs> So he bought a couple of like, you know, products and he started uh, kind of, he built the whole operation right. all around Japan. Mm. And my father took it uh, almost like, I think, uh, 30 years ago. And he's running it from there, although he was not necessarily expected to be the management at the first stage. Right. So, um, you know, he was studying American studies in, at Brown University. Mm. And, you know, actually my grandfather got into a court case because he was involved in some illegal uh, loans or something. Oh, really? So he he lost at the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, he was jailed for four years or something. Really? So my grandmother actually uh, wrote a letter to my father to stop the uh, uh, his graduate uh, master's degree. So he was pursuing PhD, but he just got master's and he came back to Japan and he started running, a, you know, half of the company. So, you know, my, my parents' life, my father's life is very interesting. Mm. And now he kind of creates all these crazy stuff, crazy <laughs> things. Uh, my grandfather was, you know, also like, you know, had a very interesting, interesting life coming from Inner Mongolia, but also like having Tibetan background, assumingly, so. You know, it's just uh, a lot of coincidence, you know, to come here. I how, how did I think? How did you find out he had a Tibetan background? So uh, m when my father passed away, my grandfather passed away. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather's friend, you know, who was actually, you know, part of the exchange program, coming to Japan uh, after right before World War Two, basically wrote a book for my grandfather, and in the book it says that you know his name was Chodo Pochak. Mm. So in Japan, like my fa grandfather's name is Sadato Kan, and I didn't know anything about Chodo Pochak. I was very curious. And, you know, a couple of years ago, I was uh, fortunate to be selected as one of the delegates for the initiative called Asia 21. It's a uh, Asia society running a like, kind of lead young leadership initiative around US Asia Pacific. So I was invited to, uh, you know, join the trip to Mongolia. There, like, you know, I could meet a lot of people, like, you know, in the government, in the business industry, and mm. also, like, you know, kind of, uh, I could get to know, uh, like, you know, kind of cultural, academic people there. And, you know, I was asking around about uh, my grandfather's name, because that was the only thing I knew. So Mongolian people said that, although, you know, I was sure that, you know, he was from Inner Mongolia, it was not Mongolian. You know, his name was Chodo Pocha, but was not Mongolian. And one guy, actually, he's an American researcher uh, who basically studies around uh, Mongolian history, told me that it might be Tibetan. And it is entirely possible that, you know, my grandfather is in Mongolia with Tibetan background because one of the seven uh, kings in Inner Mongolia was actually Tibetan Lama. So if my grandfather was from that clan, you know, it could be possible that like, you know, he has a Tibetan name. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then like later on uh, that year, basically, I was also like invited to go come visit India. Then I was, uh, you know, invited to visit in Tibetan government in exile uh, as a 
part of a delegation from Asia Society. So I asked around, you know, about my grandfather's name again. Wow, and yeah. I had a conversation with the uh, Minister of Education and, you know, uh, art or something. And he said that it's the better name. So I was like, wow. You know, <laughs> I felt like I was guided by Asia Society. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Basically, I think your grandfather's had a very interesting life. Your father's had a very mm -hmm. interesting life. You're having a very interesting yeah. life as well. So <laughs> thank you. Um, basically, I think our viewers, maybe they can see this fascinating character <laughs> just behind you. I'm sure they're right. wondering, what is that character? Are you going to mm -hmm. tell us about it? So do you mind just telling us a bit about this, this character? Yes, this is called Usada. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if it is a uh, guy or girl or like any kind of sex, but, you know, uh, my sister actually created, you know, this character, like when she was in high school, and we just <laughs> kind of took it, you know, to be a mascot character for our best selling products called Lifebird. And, you know, we have, we always have, you know, since then, since 10 years ago, we always have, you know, his face, you mm. know, on a package. And also we have, we create some little toys, you know, to enjoy something with the, share something with the customers, I guess. Could we, could we maybe hear what the, what the yeah. voice is or what? So this is... Yada. Yada. <laughs> Yamete. Yada. Yada. So this randomly speaks like it, it has like three patterns of like phrases Sota, and Sota, sing. Sota. So... 10 years ago, we, you know, kind of gave away, you know, these toys with the, uh, you know, to the customers, basically end users. Mm. They really loved it. And usually like, uh, you know, lifeguard is sold among, you know, among like, you know, guys, right? teenagers, like, you know, to early 20s. But, you know, when we kind of gave this out, out away, basically like all the like high school students, mm. female, Loved it. I see. So, you know, that was the only time we were popular among, you know, girls. Fantastic. Uh, Lifeguard, I think, it's a functional drink, right? We yes, it is. Yes, it is. It contain. It comes with uh, seven uh, vitamins and seven amino acids. Right. Uh, with the loyal jerry and honey. So my grand, uh, my father actually, uh, you know, designed it in twenty eight years ago. Okay. And it was. You know, from the very first stage, it was it had a comprise package. It was kind of com controversial. I I heard, you know, because a lot of people like you know still had negative image for camouflage because they experienced World War Two. I see. Uh, you know, some old, you know senior figures at the soft drink industry was telling my father, Mr. Khan, like you know, I don't necessarily like your new drink because you know I went to kamikaze or something. Right. Wow. But my father replied, uh, yeah, thank you for your feedback, but I went to Spain and everyone's wearing a camouflage t-shirt. So <laughs> it seems like, you know, maybe it's cool for young people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Interesting. And these are the two, this is a Japanese tea, right? Yes, Ochoa. this is a Japanese tea. We uh, contract with a local farmer who's been uh, practicing uh, organic farming for over 30 years. And he, when he started, Actually, uh, his entire village, you know, kind of tried to expel him because uh, everyone was using uh, uh, fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And tea leaves, basically, right, you know, they put, uh, you know, fertilizer 18 times a year. Right. And, so you know, tea leaves just like, you know, kind of only process from that tea leaves. They don't wash or anything. So just layers of like uh, artificial fertilizer mm. or pesticides is on. Right. So, you know, and eventually, like, you know, kind of the farmer's village was contaminated, you know, by those. And right. when they took a bath, they kind of feel itchy. Oh, really? So he decided to, like, get out of it. And, you know, he kind of, uh, you know, told everyone, let's start organic farming, which was, uh, you know, which created a huge controversy. Right. But he started from seven people. Now the entire village is practicing organic farming. Fantastic. So the supply of these tea leaves are very limited. So, you know, we are kind of using, you know, what they could produce by maximum amount. Fantastic. So that's one thing that, you know, us like small company can do. 
Wonderful. Yeah. Good. News. I'd like to interview him as well. One yeah, moment. yeah, he's great. <laughs> and this this product, this looks like a mayonnaise uh, uh -huh. kind of container or something. Uh -huh. Can you just tell quickly about this one? Yeah. So this is part of Nanchates series. Uh, <laughs> I we really like to make you know kind of people laugh out of our products. Uh, you know, even us like small like soft drink company sells like you know about two million pro like bottles of drinks every year, and I think it's I see it as a media, you know, to interact with the uh, end users. Mm -hmm. So you know, I basically send it to like you know all the like companies or like uh, government people, who I assume they have, uh, kind of, uh, straight or like squared meeting. <laughs> you know, with that laugh, so I asked my friends to like you know bring it to their meetings so that you know all these like middle aged like you know kind of tough like managers would <laughs> have fun at the meeting. <laughs> you you very kindly sent me a case to Globis and mm -hmm. I was actually giving out to people mm -hmm. at Globis and everyone was it, it, it caused like, this <laughs> wow and people are laughing so uh, it definitely works. Very thanks. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so moving on now. Um, right. Can, when you first went to America, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, doing your MBA at Stanford mm -hmm. and so on, can you, I mean, did anything surprise you or shock you about mm -hmm. lifestyle or the way, mm -hmm. you know, anything? Um, I was so surprised mm -hmm. how helpful and supportive they are. I didn't even speak English, you know. I, I mean, I wrote my graduate thesis for my gra uh, undergraduate program in English, but actually uh, my English skill was very bad. So when I first moved to US, it was very tough. I even went to my uh, professor saying, so uh, I don't understand English and I don't understand accounting. So I don't know what you are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Daisuke, I'm Turkish, but I studied accounting so that I understand, do study. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> but you know, what happened is that you know, people just help me a lot mm. at, or at least try to help. You know, for example, like my dorm mate, you know, told me that Daisuke, your English is so bad. You know, <laughs> if you do not mind, I'll correct every single mistake you make. So, you know, I'm not sure, like, you know, if this can be broadcasted, but, you know, the first thing he corrected me was, like, Daisuke, you don't give a bathroom. You take <laughs> it might be cut off but you know that's my starting point and you know the guy next sat next to me Alex Clipper you know he's my best friend yet still and he's like you know he called me right before the final exam I was having very you know tough time understanding accounting and he's like Daisuke if you have any question like just ask me I can like answer questions because I used to work for finance I said Alex thank you but uh, I don't even know what to ask, but I really appreciate your, <laughs> your consideration. So that's where you know I started. But everyone tried to support me, and maybe that's why like California like or Silicon Valley like culture. Right. But I really just appreciate you know kind mm. of people reaching out, you know, to help people with challenges. Mm. Interesting. Mm. And how how would you compare the mm. kind of Californian lifestyle with say here in Tokyo or? Japan. Um, so Tokyo, I mean, <laughs> I, I found it, you know, too big and too many people. Right. Every morning, like, you know, I maybe like pass by like more than like thousand or like 10,000 people or something, yeah. you know, within like 14 minutes commute yeah. you know, from my home to here. Uh, I, I sometimes get tired <laughs> of people, yeah. but I'm still like, you know, seeing a lot of people like, coming into my office and just yeah. like, you know, kind of create values with me. Yeah. So, that's kind of joking part, but like California, you have to kind of find people. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, whenever I see people, like I'm like, yeah, hello. Uh, in Tokyo, like, yes, I have too many people. Right? Um, but, uh, you know, Tokyo now has like a lot of entrepreneurs, like, you know, to be at mm. least. And, you know, we are trying to build, you know, kind of entrepreneurial mindset among young people, including students. And also there could be like some kind of like young, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, who's successful, and, you know, uh, kind of bridging, you know, Japan and uh, US and Silicon mm. Valley as well. Mm. So 
I, I, I feel like, you know, maybe Tokyo was a, a bit boring to me mm. you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah. But now that I have, like, you know, some people around me, like, you know, who kind of shares the same value. Right. And also, you know, have college actually to build on to their future, or build kind of uh, pursue solutions, you know, for the future, not yeah. to like conserve, you know, what we have right now. Mm. So it's, I feel now Tokyo is very dynamic. Mm. And, you know, I'm, me running this kind of, you know, solid business, yeah. kind of in collaborating with, you know, a lot of interesting people right. who's passing like, you know, diverse uh, future. Right can create, I think, you know, a lot of interesting changes going yeah. for us. I'm very excited about it. On that point, I mean, mm. a, lot of, a lot of our viewers, maybe they, mm. they have the view that, you know, the lost decade of Japan mm. has mm. turned into 20 years, you mm. know, of, of this kind of stagnation. Right. But obviously there's a very different side of the mm. picture you're telling, our, mm -hmm. telling us about. What, how do you see Japan in the next kind of three, five, ten years? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so three, five, ten years, it's... So it's just, you know, two years has passed since the earthquake and tsunami, yeah. uh, March 11th. Mm. And interestingly, like a lot of things is, you know, changing backward, actually. Uh, changing know, backwards? Backwards. After two years, uh, you know, this April, actually, I saw a lot of people, like, you know, moving around their positions in, like, bureaucracy education. And, you know, I think what the earthquake and tsunami you know, kind of revealed was a critical issues that Japan was not necessarily like facing or mm. addressing well, mm. although they were there like forever, mm. such as like aging, such as like updating the system, like education system, you know, it's like the speed of updating, you know, updates uh, like so quick now, you know, you kind of get updates for software applications every, base, every, every day basically right, right now. But why education doesn't change? Why, like, you know, the way we work doesn't change? Why, the like, you know, the system is not necessarily like, changed. I see. So, you know, I, I really feel that, like, you know, thanks to maybe the past mm. of, you know, kind of without any change or anything, mm. we now feel that, like, you know, we kind of, feel strongly about we have to build changes and you know now like the government of whoever maybe like you know there's some people like you know who's very passionate about changing but mm -hmm. i don't necessarily really see you know the like change mindset is penetrating like uh, middle class or like you know in those who within the institution right right so the now, like, after two years, okay, everything is normal now. I see. So, you know, the education is kind of trying to think, you know, okay, we are back in normal. But right. what is normal? Normal is, it's like, they are just trying to, like, you know, preserve the system, right. which was not necessarily working. Right. We have to build onto our future. Right. We have to, education have to provide something some skills to survive through and create their own future right. for students. Right, right. So, you know, the way I say backward is like, you know, kind of resuming the system which was not working, was not Before. necessarily helping, but that's kind of, that could be the path. I see. If we do not work hard to like kind of guide them to toward future. Right. So in three years, you know, I really hope to see that like, Okay, we have like aging society. We have like uh, population sh sh shrinking population. Mm. We have maybe potentially shrinking market coming from that. Right. You know how we could overcome that. Mm. You know we at least I would, I'd like to see, and I'm very kind kind of committed to build maybe like you know one small success, you know in three years, and also like you know kind of bridging those success like you know to each other. So that maybe I can showcase like you know some of the examples that how Japan or like aging population, you know, kind of growing, expanding uh, healthcare costs or mm. whatever, will be addressed mm. at least, or maybe like you know solved, mm. you know, to the global arena. Mm -hmm. And in five, you know, to ten years, I'm not sure where I'm going, you know, to be, but you know, I just kind of want to sustain, right. you know, my commitment. Uh, and also, like, you know, co-create with you know, a lot of young people. 
to maybe gather our voice, you know, to uh, those who may be aged. Right. Because I see the biggest problem we are going to face is the generational gap. Right. You know, with you know those who uh, is like almost retiring, right. and those who have to like sustain the system. Right. Right. So, so do you, is there anything you're actually working on or you're, you're kind of planning things? At the moment, um, so, you know, my, running my business is very interesting. Mm. It's like a small, like, a, you know, kind of 420 people. Mm. But, you know, we have like, you know, people from 20s right to 60s. Mm. And, you know, it's like uh, we distributing the profit mm. or how we design the salary system, how mm. we design like the corporate rules and mm. everything. It's something like policy making as well. Right. right. So I'm kind of experimenting and trying to like figure out, you know, what's the optimal model for now and maybe like in you know five to ten years, right? right. So changing the system is kind of tough because we have you know fifty years of in the, like history. Right. Uh, we have the facts and you know the way we do it. We cannot change that, you know, like in one day. But right. I'm just kind of trying to, you know, strategize right. to build onto that, and. You know, I'm also working on like tofu project, which is you know bridging uh so entrepreneurship of U.S. and Japan. You know, I brought I took like we took basically nine entrepreneurs, you know, from Japan to U.S. to like uh, experience entrepreneur you know entrepreneurship or design thinking right happening right now at Silicon Valley, and then we also brought uh, top tier entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and students at MIT Media Lab come visit Japan share their updates and also like, you know, visit the Tohoku region, you know, to uh, uh, see like, you know, what happened. And also like, you know, had discussion and session workshop with uh, local high school students. Wow. Actually, who's kind of trying to come up with a business model, you know, to build onto their own future. So we went to, we visited Fukushima High School and you know, we kind of have students, seven group of students like, you know, present in front of us. And you know, pro top tier like venture capitalists, entrepreneurs will give a feedback, you know, to Fantastic. those like uh, students. Wow. And you know, what we did well was listening to their story and kind of empathize, you know, to them so that we could be on the same page. Mm. And it's not that like you know we provide the knowledge, we provide the way, you know, the platform or like uh, kind of you know giving. Okay, this is how you do it. Thing. Right. It's like why you are trying to do this and you know let me know how you can help mm. this is the attitude right in that creates the trust fantastic and you know we could mm. even overcome the language barrier as well you know, what was the name of that project tofu is there like a maybe a link to a yeah, yeah, tofu or project okay mm. maybe we can we can add that yeah, yeah. as a kind of subtitle mm. thank you very much fascinating um mm. Can I ask you, uh, just moving on a bit, mm -hmm. um, well, it's kind of the same thing because you, you're obviously very passionate about mm -hmm. entrepreneurship mm -hmm. change and you, know, you really want to do something for mm -hmm. Japan's future. Where does that kind of fire come from? I mean, why don't you just kind mm -hmm. of play golf on your days off and, and just <laughs> kind of relax or whatever? But, but, yeah. um, I, I really feel that I'm fortunate to be here. You know, I, I, to be honest, like, I didn't understand the importance of human rights until last two years ago. <laughs> you know, Japan, like, we are so fortunate. We have, like, a lot of things. We are wealthy. Mm. So, you know, reading the textbook of the, like, uh, human rights or, like, whatever. Mm. It's like, whatever. Mm. You know, when I was kind of visiting a lot of different countries, you know, I saw a lot of people. And I saw a lot of challenges people are facing. And, you know, gradually, like, I felt that, you know, without everyone supporting me, you know, just impossible, you know, for me to be here. Mm. And, you know, the most simple case is, like, you know, people working for my company. Mm. And, you know, I, I really do not like, you know, calling them employee. You know, it's not, I'm not the employer or like an employee or something. You know, we are, we are the people like, you know, who's kind of trying to values, you know, create values through our business. And, you know, it's, they worked very hard, you know, to send me to a very expensive school in the U.S. You know, mm. Stanford is one of the you know, most expensive schools. Mm. And, you know, it's like, uh, the, it requires, it costs the, profit of one person working very, very hard 
for the entire year mm. to send me to like two years in GS, you know, business right. school. So, you know, I really didn't like the model of, you know, people working for someone to send his son, you know, to the good school. While like, you know, they do not have choice to like, you know, send their own children. Mm. So, you know, my, my dream, you know, first coming back was like, I want to build a business that pays enough, you know, for my uh, basically teammates. So those who are like, you know, working for my company do have choice mm. in their own future. Mm. And that's, you know, so that kind of thing, it's like, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily like, you know, here because it's me. It's, mm. I'm just like, you know, I'm just like supported, you know, to be here mm. by a lot of people. And you know my job is I think more to like you know kind of build a better future for next generation mm. you know so that maybe like you know I don't know the accumulation of that kind of practice I think will you know only create a better world mm. and that's kind of how I think it's a very kind of honorable kind of goal or intention that that's driving you yeah yeah and you know, I still feel fortunate that I could be in that position because there are so many people who uh, do not have choice. Right. right. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank mm. you. Um, any? Uh, this is one of the questions I always mm. ask. Uh, you know, our guests is any any sort of Japanese historical figure, political figure, mm -hmm. sports person, mm -hmm. or anyone like that that you admire. Or? I really like Haruki Murakami. Um, uh, I just read his uh, new book as well. Some people think, you know, there's no conclusion to this book or something. So what's the name? His new book is? Uh, so uh, I don't know about English title, but Shikisai wo motanai tazaki tsukuru no junrei no toshi. Okay. Mm, it's a long, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to translate that, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, the, the reason why I like, you know, his writing is that he's, it's like, you know, kind of he's running a marathon, mm. you know. It's never the end of the journey, you know. He's always, you know, on his journey to somewhere. And we never know the future. But, you know, we kind of at least try in a kind of struggle to find the answer to the issues and problems that we have in, you know, right now. And, you know, I really feel that, you know, Haruki Murakami is the guy, like, you know, who's kind of you know, struggling to get there where you do not necessarily know where it is. Mm. So I really kind of feel emphasized, you know, to share that kind of vision mm. because I don't know where I'm going to be in future. Right. Uh, but, you know, only thing I could do is using my best judgment to do something I feel light about. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now you... You you said you know you've traveled around mm -hmm. a lot of countries, but you know you spent a lot of time in America. Mm -hmm. um, if you could combine the strengths of say America with mm -hmm. Japan and maybe Brazil, I don't know. You, you seem to like Brazil or something. <laughs> I love if you Brazil. could pull them all together into a uh -huh. superpower, what what bits would you take? Um, so I would say uh, the attitude to embrace failure. You know, this might be more California, almost Silicon Valley. Uh, with Japanese uh, passion to perfection, mm. I, I think you know what, what is right right now is not going to be right in the future. The only thing is that not like by you know our future is going to be better if we do not share the best practice, but we just you know embracing failure. You know we have to like uh, encourage people to fail mm. because. You know, if I'm with someone else, you know, I could teach maybe the right way. If I'm the parents, you know, I could teach my kids to, you know, kind of about the right way of doing things. But it doesn't necessarily teach them, mm. you know, how they are going to make a judgment call. Right. I think, you know, it is more important that if they are by themselves and right. they have to choose their path, mm. you know, how they are going to choose. And if it is a, at least kind of okay, or it doesn't kill people, kill mm. them, actually. Mm, mm, mm. So, you know, I think, you know, to do that, I think we have to let them fail. 
and you know accumulation failure will lead to higher probability of success I think fantastic and so and something from Brazil or South America what would you add uh, <laughs> embracing diversity as well people are so different to each other right you know there's no like right one right model fits all right you know people are people and Maybe like you know, when we were growing macroeconomically, right. you know, whatever you do, basically your economy is growing. Right. So that's where like you know people think, okay, you know, join the big you know mainstream, and then you are going to like contribute to growth anyway. And there, like you don't you do not necessarily to stand out. Now, you know, we are stuck. You know, we are not growing. You know, by doing something same with someone else, it's not necessarily going to contribute because we right. have, more, you know, already have enough people. Right. And so, you know, what we have to do is like, you know, kind of, we have to know what we are good at, and we have to find a way we can how we can you know contribute to something bigger than you know me or right. us. Right. So that and you know we have to like cooperate with the institution. Right. So that we do not necessarily be like, oh, I don't care about the government, you know. Right. But we really have to be on the system mm. to create changes, mm. to convince like you know stakeholders right now, mm. and also like you know create new values. Mm. And that's the dilemma, like you know, we always always have to face. It's not that like you know you can get away with the system and just like and travel around. Right. You know, it's just that you have to commit, you know, to survive through this system. Right. With adding, you know, uh, extra contribution right. for your maybe offspring or something. Mm. You know, I've been in Japan uh, mm -hmm. over 10 years mm -hmm. and, you know, living, working with mm -hmm. Japanese people, but I can always do, do with some advice. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips about how foreigners mm -hmm. can get on well with Japanese people? <laughs> um, it's... <laughs> We are human beings, by the way. You know, we are very shy sometimes. You know, people are so, so shy, you know, facing the foreigners. When I, uh, you know, had my Swedish friend visited Japan, I was trying to catch a cab in Roppongi, and then I called a cab. And, you know, I told the driver, uh, you know, uh, Mandarin Oriental Hotel in Japanese. And then he said, I don't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> and I said a couple of times in Japanese, and he was like, I don't speak English. Only because maybe like, you know, I was next to the Caucasian guy, like, you know, he right. thought I was foreign as well. Right. So we, we like, you know, this is the trouble like, you know, I kind of uh, see sometimes. And, but, you know, here's the other example. Once you ice break, you know, we are very friendly people. Right. So one of my other, like, entrepreneur friend uh, who came visit Japan to close a deal with the Japanese big trading company, uh, he was in the board meeting with a very solid, you know, board of directors at uh, one of the biggest trading companies in Japan. And the first thing he said, the, this Israeli guy said, was, Oh, okay, I know ja one Japanese, you know, uh, phrase. Namamugi, namagome, namatamago. <laughs> so I told him about this phrase, you know, over the dinner, you know, at Stanford. And then he said that, and then, like, all the serious guys start, like, you know, laughing so loud. <laughs> and, you know, the deal, you know, went so well. And, you know, he closed the deal and very happy. Fantastic, great. So I think icebreaking is the most important thing. You know, we are human beings, you know, right. we just, you know, have slight, like, differences, right. such as language. Right. But what Risa said, when I actually took the public speaking class in Silicon Valley, the teacher said, you know, it's only 7% of what you are communicating is language. Right. You know, other than that, it's just, you know, your posture, your, like, body language, you know, your yeah. smile or something. Right, right. So, I think, you know, if you smile and if you have one joke that penetrates, like, you know, <laughs> people's eyes <laughs> in a persona, you know, should do. <laughs> Wonderful. Daisuke, it's been really interesting talking to you. Very final question. Uh -huh. Any final message for our viewers? And remember, there's people from uh -huh. all around the world watching. Mm -hmm. Any okay. message? Um, you know, 
Japan is an island country. Uh, it, it has its own beauty. And once you visit, I think, you know, you'll find a lot of interesting uh, stuff. And, you know, you'll discover a lot of good things and bad things about Japan. What we really need is, you know, for you to come visit and share your insights with us. Because we really have to update, you know, and we really have to and want to kind of be friends with you guys. So, you know, thank you for your time and I hope you come visit soon. Thank you, Daisuke. Thank you so much. Been, oh, thank you. Yeah. Been really interesting talking to you. Um, so this was uh, actually two guests today, Daisuke and Usadar as well. We've had two guests with us today. Uh, thank you both for being with us. Um, I think you'll agree it's been a, a really uh, sort of intimate uh, a very open um, sort of interview today. Daisuke shared some very sort of personal, sort of intimate things also about his family and background. So very, very interesting. Um, I'm Adam Kassar from Globis. You've been watching Inside Japan. Thank you very much and catch you next time. <laughs>